Who should the Canadians pair with Shea Weber? The panel will tell you what they think at the end of the show. This is Hockey Inside Out. I'm Adam Susser. Welcome to this week's show. We have uh, Mr. Stu Cowan from the Gazette on the end, CBC Daybreak's Jessica Resnack, and joining us once again from TSN 690, Mr. Dan Robertson. Thanks for being here. Unfortunately, Asperi Kotkaniemi was the only player who peed in his pants upon the return of Shea Weber on Tuesday night as Carolina weathered the storm, facing 22 shots in the third period and 49 throughout the game while beating the Canadians 2-1. The team gets an A for effort, but it wasn't enough to conquer hot Carolina goaltender Curtis McElhaney. Can we expect more of the same when the Canadians host the Rangers on Saturday night? Well, Cut King Emmy already gets the quote of the year <laughs> for that one when he was asked what it's like to stand in front of the net when Shea Weber is winding up. And he says, I think I peed my pants. That's the quote of the year right there. And but I love how he said to try it <laughs> to try, as well. Yeah, he said, you guys should try it. He said, you guys should try it. I think I'll take a pass on that one. <laughs> Personally, I tried it. It wasn't, it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a case the Canes just don't have finishers. I mean, all those shots on goal, I mean, you know, Charles Hudon had an empty net. He couldn't put it in. Nicholas Delore had an empty net. He couldn't put it in. You know, Arturi Lakin just can't score. Uh, you know, talk about Kotkaniemi, I'm thinking it might be time to switch lines with Kotkaniemi and Dano and let Kotkaniemi play with Tatar and Gallagher, a couple of guys who can finish and see what the kid can do. But, you know, shots on goal almost can be a meaningless stat if you can't beat the goalie. And this team just doesn't have enough guys who can finish right now. And you start to worry if they're going to go back to what it was last season. Remember how many times they faced a goaltender who was not an elite goaltender in the NHL, but he was able to play like one against the Canadians. And after the game, they would say, you know what, the goaltender was just hot. We threw everything at him and he was able to stop it. But you have to find a way to get something past a goaltender and throw him off his game and not make the other goaltender look like he's an all-star uh, goaltender in the NHL. Well, how many visiting goalies have been the first star over the last couple of years at the Bell Centre, too? No, it's true. And I think part of it is another old story it's power play or lack thereof it was 30th uh, in the league going into the game against Carolina and not just the fact that they're having a hard time scoring it's it's almost like it, it's a momentum killer when they get it at this point Weber is back and in theory that should help but and you know it'll take some time for him to round into shape but that is it doesn't seem to matter who the power play coach is over the last couple of years uh, who the personnel is uh, for the most part, they're having a hard time there and it needs to change. And that's a good question that what do they do with Kirk Muller because he's the guy in charge of the power play but Kirk Muller is just you know such a guy that everyone loves in Montreal that could he potentially you know be in the hot seat when it comes to jobs because the power play is just not doing very well. I mean PP to the Canes I think stands for pass the puck like to shoot the puck. <laughs> I mean you watch the power play and they pass it and they pass it and they pass it and Jonathan Drouin keeps making like unnecessary dangerous passes on the power play like to be an easy pass and he'll try the one between the legs They're just getting too fancy. I think he needs to shoot the puck. I mean they're gonna do that with Shea Weber against Carolina he had he only got three shots on goal, but he wound up a bunch of times, and I pity the guy who has to go out there and block it. But they got to shoot the puck more. I mean, they're just they're trying to be too fancy on the power play. Shoot the puck, get the rebounds, and go from there. But power play aside, last time I checked, the Canadians were second in terms of regular five-on-five -five goals scored. So w wouldn't you just say that maybe this is an inevitable slump that was bound to happen with this team? Uh, I think it is. That, yeah, I think it is. I think it's almost a leveling off of... of of the team. I mean, they get off to a really hard, hot start and they earned it. But I, I think in the end, you are who you are. And, you know, if you look at Buffalo, I guess on the other spectrum, they had won 10 straight. And there are games in there that you're looking at it and they, they probably shouldn't have won. Maybe the Canadians should have taken a couple of these games, but in the end, that, that doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, it's surprising. If anyone were to tell me that the Canadians would have been in the top one, two, ten of teams scoring five on five this year, I would, I would not have believed you. I think the, the bright side of that is you would think it's easier to fix the power play than it is to fix if you can't score five on five. So that might be a, one of the bright things. But like this power play, as Jess said, has been bad for a long time. Like it's, you know, you think Weber's gonna gonna fix it, but again, if they just key on Weber, you hope maybe that might open other guys. But it's 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 a head scratcher as to why this team just can't score in the power play. They they have the talent to do it. Carl Alsner was put on waivers as soon as Shea Weber returned. No team picked him up. What do you think the Canadians should do with him? Well, he's going to go to Laval, and I would imagine. I know his agent's trying to work out a deal to trade him somewhere. The Canadians would obviously have to eat some of the money. 
Uh, if they can't make a deal, I figure at the end of the season, they probably buy him out. Yeah. Um, it's hard to feel sorry for a guy making $6 million a year, but Carl Osner is such a good guy that I do feel a little bit sorry for him. Having said that, I think he'll do good in Laval. I think, like, I don't think he's going to go down there and mope. I think he's a, he's a real veteran. He's a good guy. I think he'll go down there and he'll help some of the younger defensemen. Uh, it can't be easy for him. But uh, I don't think he'll be a bad influence down there. I think even if he spends the rest of the season there, I think he might be able to help some of the other younger guys and just show them. I mean, he's a good pro, Carl Isles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the game has passed him by. He's too slow to play the way it is now, but he's a, he's a good guy and he's been a good pro for a long time. And kudos to the Canadians for doing that because that was, you know, the right decision to make, which sometimes can be difficult to do it with a veteran player who still has about three years left in his contract making a lot of money. So you have to put your ego aside to do this. And as Claude Julien said, it really was a strategic move because no one was going to pick up Carl Alsner off the waiver wire so then let's just say you put someone else there and then you might lose a younger player who's cheaper uh, that you might need further down the line but like you said the fact that Alsner had such a good personality you don't have to worry about him coming down to Laval and being disruptive there as uh, Joel Bouchard's trying to put on his own um, you know men mentality around this team to try and be a, you know a positive type of environment. Yeah, I think too the fact is there's not a lot of talent right now on defense in Laval. So if there's an injury or two, I think we'll see Carl Osner again. I think you're right. And, and in a 5-6 role as opposed to the yeah. top four where he was originally but supposed to Of course, to play. and that's, yeah. that's yeah. A part of a bigger problem, that, isn't it? I mean, with mm -hmm. other defensemen who are playing in higher slots than they should be because overall the defensive core just isn't good enough. But what you both said is true. I mean, Carl at the start of the season said, I realize my situation. I'm not going to come in here and pout talking about not playing for the Canadians. That's not going to help anybody. So I think he will really help in Laval, but I wouldn't be surprised if they buy him out. I'm one of those guys. I'm not too clear on the buyout implications. I don't get caught up in that, but uh, you would think at some point that might happen. Uh, Matthew Pekka was one of Mark Benjamin's off-season signings. In 21 games, he has one goal and five assists. He was a healthy scratch on Saturday versus Boston, and then again uh, as well uh, as well on Tuesday against Carolina. It was signing Pekka a mistake? I think Bergevin might want to take a pass on the free agent market <laughs> next year. That's too. I mean, David Pekka, it's not a lot of money. They did give him a one-way contract though to get him, uh, but I think Michael Chapu has played a big role in him not playing. Chapu has really impressed me since he's been called up from Laval. He works his butt off. He's uh, an effective fourth line center. He keeps the puck in the the opposition's end a lot of the time. He's also a good penalty killer. So I think he's probably stepped ahead of uh, of him in the, in the Pekka in the depth chart. And uh, you know, it's not a big money deal, but it was he was sort of the free agent the Canadians really wanted during the off season. And uh, you know, maybe he'll be back playing the wing. But at this point, I think Michael Chaput's going to be hard to beat out for the fourth line center job. I think. I think Mark Bergman was hoping to sort of find a, another Paul Byron with Matthew Pekka in that mm. situation. But as you said, it's not a lot of money. It's $1.3 million that he's making. But it's also difficult to attract free agents to come to Montreal, especially after last season. The team was horrible. You had a goaltender who's supposed to be an elite goaltender have the worst year of his career. Your star defenseman underwent two surgeries in a short period of time. Uh, you know, is expected to miss quite a few months of the season. Now Shea Weber is back, but it's not an ideal place. If you're a free agent, you're not saying that's where I'm going. You know, mm. you're looking elsewhere for it. So it is just difficult for Mark Bergevin at that point to attract free agents to yeah, come. It was sort of a, a strange signing for me. And again, I'm with you too. I don't think it's a huge deal because it's not a lot of money. But the fact that it was a one day way deal showed me that they wanted him. Um, but he'd only played, I think, 24 NHL games before that. Uh, with Tampa Bay, but they're looking, always looking for depth down the middle, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's it more than anything. But uh, there's an interesting sort of battle competition-wise with guys like Shapir. And I mean, you know, you look at Pekka not playing, so Jacob Delarose isn't here anymore. Mm -hmm. Thomas Placanitz isn't here anymore. So you would think that he would have been in there. I think he's much better. Uh, it, he doesn't work on the wing for me, so he really has to show something. And a coach, a guy who used to coach him told me, he's so slight, it's easy to knock him off the puck, mm -hmm. so that's a big problem for him. Do you think if the team is able to maintain where they're at now and maybe eke into the playoffs, they'll be a lot more attractive to free agents at the end of this season? I think if they show potential down the line, they might be able to do that. But right now, the situation is the, the players that you need this uh, to be on this team to take the next step 
aren't interested in coming here. So you have to do, you have to make some sort of progression or have some nice prospects that you're saying, okay, down the line, these players are going to develop into some really good NHLers. And that's something that I want to be a part of uh, with these young players. Well, it's like with Toronto. Toronto was a place a lot of free agents didn't want to go a few years ago. And now that they're a good young team with a chance to win a Stanley Cup, everybody seems to want to go there. But, yeah. you know, there's a, the same problems here in Montreal with taxes and weather and everything we've discussed before are always going to be there. And when the team's not winning, that's just one more strike against uh, coming here. Listen, I don't want to go to Toronto either. <laughs> <laughs> Is the return of Shea Weber enough to make the Canadians a playoff team? In and of itself, um, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think he, it, there are many players in the league that are big enough difference makers. So if, um, if his return is sort of, or if their playoff berth rests on his return or his level of play, you know, I, I just don't think they're a good enough team anyway. But I, he's obviously going to help a great deal in a lot of ways, not just on the power play, in the room and that sort of thing. But I just think that it's going to be a, a battle right down to the end. And uh, regardless, you know, if they had two Shea Webers, I think that would be the problem. I think they've overachieved a little bit. Um, but it's great to see him back, uh, obviously, for a lot of reasons. What about if they traded Weber for P.K. Subban? You think that would be? <laughs> not that again. <laughs> not going well, you know what, though? If... Bergevin had kept Markov instead of signing Osner. Mm -hmm. There's your guy. I think I, I think Markov could probably still play with Weber. Yeah. Judging by the other defensemen they have now, he's, he might. You know, it's it's for at least for a little bit of a period anyway. But I think that was a big mistake when he let Markov go and and yeah. signed Osner. I think that was a bad. Uh, bad move there, but uh, can Weber? I mean, it's it's remarkable this team was able to stay in a playoff position without Weber. So the fact he's back can definitely help them maybe squeeze in. But the key is going to be Carey Price. Yeah. I mean, if Carey Price, Carey Price has to be better. I mean, okay, he's not getting a lot of help from the defense. He's been let out, left out to dry a few times. But when you're paying your goalie 10.5 million dollars a year, he's got to cover up for some of those mistakes. He's got to make some big saves. You talk about McElhaney's standing on his head and stealing a game at the Bell Center. Price has done that once when he shut out Boston. He's got to do that more often. If he doesn't pick up his game, this team's not going to make the playoffs, no matter how well Shea Weber plays. Yeah, I agree that Shea Weber's not going to come here and be the savior. And, you know, Brendan Gallagher has said that leading up to Shea Weber's return, that, you know, don't expect all of a sudden a huge change with the Canadians. But he will have a good impact in the locker room. He really is, he is the captain of the team, and he really is that strong leader, and that can rub off there. But I don't necessarily think now that Shea Weber's back and he's healthy, that that's going to be the push that's going to have them be in the playoff picture. Well, he does have a trickle down effect on defense. Like now, Jeff Petrie's the second pairing defenseman, which is where he should be. I mean, if he's your number three defenseman, pretty good number three <laughs> defenseman to have. And then Jordy Ben drops down to the third pairing, which is where he should be. The problem is they still need to find somebody to play with Weber. Uh, you know, Schlemko did okay the other night, but I don't know if he's a long term solution to that and Claude Julien certainly didn't sound like he was <laughs> I, with his comments after the game so but I mean he just he, he knocks everybody down he eats up you know 25 minutes he played his first game back he eats up a ton of minutes which means Petrie's playing a little bit less Ben's playing a little bit less so that will definitely help but again Carey Price got to stop the puck so if not Schlemko who is the best player to serve as Weber's defense partner uh, maybe it's someone who's not on the team right now. Uh, that would sort of be my opinion, that if I'm Mark Bergevin, you need to find someone to play with him because then you have one of the best defensemen in the league and no one to go with him. You know, say for in the short term, Victor Mete, I do like him playing with him because of the experience that Victor Mete will gain playing with Shea Weber, and he got the opportunity to do that last season. But I just don't think anyone right now on the team is someone that should be Shea Weber's partner. Maybe P.K. Subban's available. <laughs> <laughs> Not that again. Come on, Adam. <laughs> I think, that's, the end. that's the end of that joke. <laughs> I think in-house, uh, you know, who intrigues me is Mike Riley. He, when, when they got him for a fifth-round pick, I thought, a guy who skates that well for a fifth-round pick, there's something wrong there. He came this year, to start this year, he's really good. Now he can't get into the lineup. And the way Claude Julien spoke about him the other day after practice, he was pretty clear that he makes too many mistakes. But he skates so well, if he can just clean up a few things, I think he'd be a good partner for him. Not an ideal partner, but I'm just looking at the guys that he, ha he has at his disposal now. Schlemko, he's too slow to play with him. Ben as well. I hate to get on these guys, but I'm just looking at a mobile guy 
Mete, I almost think, could use a little more seasoning in Laval at some point. He, he's sort of on the on the brink there. I, I think Riley, but he has to do a lot to get back in the lineup. Uh, I'd like I'd like to see Mete back. He played well with Weber last year, and Mete struggled a bit this season. I wonder how much of it's maybe confidence, a sophomore jinx, a little bit of confidence. And I think playing with Shea Weber would obviously give him a confidence boost and help him out. So I'd like to see Mete at least for a few games. Uh, you know, Claude Julien said the game against Boston was Mete's best game, which might have kept him in the lineup and kept Riley out. But I'd like to see him put Mete with Weber for a few games just to see how it worked. It worked well last year, and I think even if he does it for a couple of games, just to give Mete that little confidence boost and maybe improve his game moving forward. Yeah, I think Bergeron should at least call Nashville and see what's going on with Peter <laughs> <laughs> That's all the time that we have for this week's show. Who should the Canadians pair with Shea Weber, and is his return enough to make the team a playoff team? Let us know in the comments section below. I'm Adam Susser. I'll see you next Thursday. <laughs>